Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Ackenbaum. Dr. Ackenbaum is a surgeon scientist who received her undergraduate and medical degree from The Ohio State University. She completed her obstetrics and gynecology residency at the University of Pennsylvania and then came to Pittsburgh to complete a fellowship in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. And she also obtained a master's in clinical research there. She's now an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences. And Dr. Eckenbaum has really done, really begun some groundbreaking work focusing on post-operative cognitive disorders, specifically working to understand and prevent um, post-operative related cognitive impairment in her older urogynecologic surgery patients. And the importance of her work in this understudied area of research has been recognized by the NIH, where she's been the recipient of a National Institute of Child Health and Human Development Women's Reproductive Sciences K-12 Scholar Award, Award to study this, was also awarded an NIA RO3 grant for early medical surgical specialist transition to aging research, and most recently was awarded a K-23 award by the NIA to evaluate the association between surgery and subsequent cognitive function and everyday functioning. The Alzheimer's Association has also recognized her work awarding her an Alzheimer's Association Clinical Scientist Fellowship to promote diversity. She's won numerous teaching and academic awards already, and I think she's really poised to become a leader in the field of post-operative cognitive disorders and ADRD. So please welcome Dr. Ackenbaum. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really excited to be with you all today uh, and to, um, to give this presentation. Uh, these are just a few of my disclosures, but are not really relevant for today. So my goals for this, this presentation is one, to describe the different forms of perioperative neurocognitive disorders, also to examine the different risk factors for development of these disorders, and then describe the potential relationship between perioperative neurocognitive disorders and dementia. So just a little bit about me. So I'm a urogynecologic surgeon. I'm a board specialty trained in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. I take care of women who have pelvic floor disorders, and this includes pelvic organ prolapse, urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, pelvic pain, amongst many others, but those are sort of the big four. Uh, I had found in my practice that there were patients and families that were returning to me in the postoperative period and sharing that they were having new issues with cognition and uh, just feeling foggy. And so because I started seeing that sort of over and over again, it just begged the question, well, what is going on? What's happening? You know, we really need to look into this a bit more. I need to be talking to my patients about this. And so why the urogynecologic population? You know, a lot of the early work on perioperative neurocognitive disorders focused on cardiac surgery patients. And you can assume the reasons why, right? They're on bypass, there's issues with hypoxia, but really all surgical patients need to be thought of in terms of this potential outcome. So for urogyne patients, these are often older, frail women. And our practice here at the, the urogyne division one in four women are over 75 years old that ultimately undergo surgery. Uh, so we take care of a lot of older patients. The other issue is that the surgeries that I do are elective, but not just elective, they're deferrable, meaning that the patients don't necessarily have to undergo these surgeries in order to improve their pelvic floor issue. Uh, there's non-surgical treatment options that are available. And frankly, when I'm discussing risk benefit considerations with patients as we're discussing and potentially talking about surgery, it's very different than if I were a surgical oncologist and talking to them about surgery uh, for the indication of cancer. Also, hospitalizations are getting shorter and shorter now. The surgeries that I performed five, 10 years ago, patients would stay in the hospital three to five days. Now with enhanced re recovery after surgery protocols, people go home the same day after surgery. And so with that, there's a decreased likelihood that we're going to be able to recognize that there may some, be some changes going on from a health professional standpoint. And so ultimately the risk of perioperative neurocognitive disorders truly does influence how we counsel patients and the shared decision-making process that you undergo with a patient. And then also, of course, your surgical plan may influence that greatly, both preoperatively and intraoperatively. So I just wanna start by talking about perioperative neurocognitive disorders. Think of this as an umbrella term that incorporates all cognitive disorders that are temporally associated with surgery. I'm gonna talk about postoperative delirium and postoperative cognitive dysfunction today mainly. 
So with delirium, this, as you all know, is an acute confusional state that's characterized by inattention and fluctuations in mentation after surgery. The incidence greatly varies, as you can see, with three to 70 percent, but it really depends on who's being studied, what type of surgery was performed, how long the surgery last, lasted, and then also what criteria are being used to account for delirium. When it does happen, it's usually within the first three days, and then there are a few different forms, as you can see, hyperactive and hypoactive. There are multiple factors that are associated with delirium, but you know, a major six that are here, older age, multiple comorbidities, long surgery, as I've mentioned, any functional impairment or sensory deprivation, and then pre-existing cognitive impairment can be huge as well. And we're get concerned about this because of the poor outcomes associated with delirium, including prolonged length of stay, decreased functional independence, increased risk of dementia, caregiver burden, as well as increased healthcare cost, morbidity, and mortality. So Mark Antonio and his team uh, did a study, it's been decades since they did it, but it was great because it was a very large prospective study of 1,300 patients who underwent major non-cardiac surgery. And I bring this figure to your attention. You know, overall, they found an incidence of 9% for delirium. But if you look at the bottom squares, particularly the dotted black line and the green line, that is for orthopedic surgery and abdominal surgery when they stratified it by surgery type. And you can see there that the incidence is 9% and 5% respectively. And so the thought was that a, a urogynecologic population, the surgeries are similar in that they're more peripheral and that the incidence would likely be similar to that. Although unpublished, my group has looked at 165 patients in our, uh, in our institution here who underwent prolapse surgery and found that 12% uh, incidence of uh, delirium in these patients within the first week after surgery. And again, these patients went home, so we were doing the uh, delirium assessments over the phone. Now I want to talk about postoperative cognitive dysfunction, which I'll call POCD. Now this is different. It's subtle and likely more transient in nature, but it's an impairment of memory, information, processing speed, and concentration. It's distinct from delirium and it's also distinct from dementia and typically lasts weeks to months. This figure here, I just want to show you again, the risk factors we've talked about for delirium, but there's many that overlap with POCD. And so you can see the purple marks here that indicate age, the duration and type of surgery, pre-existing cognitive impairment and poor functional status really do clue you in to those who are at greatest risk. Now, POCD, the incidence that has been reported in the literature after major elective non-cardiac surgery ranges seven to 41%. However, this is often underestimated, and the reason why is because in order to diagnose POCD, you need to have formal neurocognitive testing performed. And as you all can imagine, that's not typically done in the clinical setting. But in research settings, when this has been done and POCD has been diagnosed, you see that it's associated with loss of independence, decreased quality of life, and again, increased healthcare costs, morbidity, and death. Now, just to talk about POCD diagnosis a bit more, I mentioned that you need to have formal neurocognitive testing performed. And typically they look at the results of this from a pre to post-surgery sort of a change, or they compare post-surgery outcomes to normative values. Now, POCD does not have an ICD-10 code. It's not recognized as a diagnosis in the DSM-5 either. So you can imagine with the research that's been done, there's a ton of heterogeneity because there's a huge lack of consensus of what criteria need to be met in order to achieve a diagnosis of POCD. And ultimately, because there's so much heterogeneity, it makes it very hard to interpret the data, let alone do any sort of meta-analysis. I was still interested in this. Patients were coming back and expressing a concern that something was happening to them postoperatively, right? I fixed one quality of life issue, but now they have a new one. And so with a team that was multidisciplinary here, women who were eligible for the study looking at POCD in a urogynecologic patient cohort, anybody who was 60 years or older and scheduled to undergo prolapse surgery with us, which is usually a two to four hour surgery, um, was eligible. We excluded women who had any baseline cognitive impairment, either a diagnosis that was given to them by a healthcare professional uh, that was in their chart, or if they had a score of less than 84 on a modified mini mental state exam, as well as any history of any major neurologic disorder. And we included stroke, MS, Parkinson's disease as well. Uh, patients needed to be able to test in English. 
any history of any drug abuse or alcohol abuse uh, also were exclusion criteria for these patients. And there were six attendings in the urogynecologic uh, division at the time that we, we did this prospective study. And the way that we defined POCD was looking for a decline of one or more standard deviations on two or more tests in our neurocognitive battery or finding a major decline of two or more standard deviations on one or more tests in that battery that we used. And we chose two weeks postoperatively as our primary endpoint, and we were interested in this endpoint clinically because at this point, patients, if they have family members coming in to help support them in the early postoperative recovery period, they're going home at this point. Many of them have resumed driving at this point. They're managing their own medications at this point. So we wanted to get a better understanding of what may be going on with them uh, from a cognitive standpoint. So out of the cohort of 91 patients, 72 completed pre- and post-operative testing. And you can see that a third of them had significant decline enough to achieve a POCD diagnosis as we defined it in our cohort. I bring your attention to this figure here. You can see each row represents one patient that met criteria for POCD. And then you can see the different cognitive tests and then subdivided into cognitive domains as well represented. One dot represents a one standard deviations decline. Two represents at least a two standard deviations decline. And for me in seeing this, I was just struck at seeing, you know, the the many of the two dots. I expected to see maybe one standard deviations to climb, but uh, seeing it, you know, pretty extensively throughout the different tests, uh, I thought was impressive in doing this because this was the first time we were looking at this in a urogynecologic patient cohort. And just to tell you more about this cohort, so again, women were 60 years and older, but the median age was 72. The uh, median uh, number of education years is 13. Uh, and then when we looked to see if there were any demographic or clinical characteristics uh, that were associated with POCD, the only things that stuck out were a frailty index score, and a baseline geriatric depression scale score. But you can see here also in this, this table, we included their actual frailty status that's generated from the score itself. And the status in itself wasn't you know, significant. And so that, you know, if you're looking at this actual number, we're talking about one versus 1.7, the clinical re relevance is unclear, but it's sort of a, I would call it just like a flag, right? For something to look at later, because this is a small cohort ultimately, uh, but maybe frailty is something that is significant that you may see with a, a bigger group. Uh, same thing with the baseline geriatric depression scale scores. You know, we're talking about 1.4 versus 2.7. You don't even get to anything really significant using that score until you're at a score above five, but maybe it's a marker of something that is of significance and of relevance. So this begged the question at the two-week point, we're seeing this, it's a third of patients, wow, what does this mean? This, co this conceptual model here just represents the potential cognitive trajectories that may be occurring in these patients who meet criteria for POCD. Line B represents what we would expect in an older population where it's largely stable, but maybe decreasing just slightly as we would expect with age. But then line C, D, and E represent, you know, a, a POCD with some recovery, and then D and E where you have a poor reco recovery or a catastrophic POCD um, that really does uh, make a huge impact on the patient. And thinking about POCD, you know, there's many different factors, right? We're thinking about the surgery, we're thinking about anesthesia. So this figure here, I, I turn your attention to just so you can really think about all of the potential variables and elements that may be contributing uh, to development of cognitive decline in the postoperative setting. So you can see just going from top down on the left side of the screen, the blood brain barrier and the status of that and the many variables that impact the blood brain barrier, vascular mechanisms, of course, inflammation as surgery is a controlled trauma the release of any inflammatory mediators and factors as a result of the surgery can impact cognitive impairment after surgery, and then neuronal synaptic level mechanisms as well. And then of course, there's the physiology of the person, the anesthesia being used, their levels, oxygen, all of these have different factors. But really, I think the neuronal and synaptic level mechanisms are interesting and important to consider. You know, what is the patient bringing to the table? It's not like we're, we send out patients for cardiac, clearance, I'm, I'm using air quotes for people who can't see me, um, or perioperative risk assessments, but we don't always necessarily include a risk assessment of the brain preoperatively, not as an, in a standardized manner anyway. 
So in thinking about other biological mechanisms of POCD, you know, there are some studies, uh, animal studies that have looked at uh, the impact of anesthesia. And in particular, ones that have looked at how inhalational agents can potentiate pathophysiologic processes associated with Alzheimer's disease. So there was a study that looked at mice exposed to sevoflurane, an inhalational anesthetic medication, which showed that there was an increase of apoptosis in the brain after being exposed to this. Uh, you know, other mice, with these mouse studies that they did, they also found that there were increased later levels of amyloid precursor protein. And then at the transgenic Alzheimer's disease mice, uh, they were found to be more susceptible to sevoflurane induced neurotoxicity when exposed to the same dose and duration as other mice. Other mechanisms to consider and that you should be thinking about cerebral microemboli. Absolutely, this could uh, you know, cause cerebral infarctions that lead to POCD. And then patients who I mentioned before, cardiac surgery, uh, some in other studies have demonstrated new postoperative lesions on MRI, um, but proving that there's actual temporal relationship to the surgery is, is difficult to do. Neuroinflammation as well absolutely can be a factor. And again, these rat models have shown that the inhalational agents may sometimes increase permeability of the blood-brain barrier. And then of course, impacting that may influence how peripheral inflammation influences the brain. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here with this model. And you can see here, starting on the left side of the screen, this is sort of an example of what's going on peripherally or with my surgery, right? I have the surgery, there's an inflammatory stimulus, which leads to systemic inflammation. Those mediators go into the bloodstream and circu uh, systemic circulation, and then ultimately get to the blood-brain barrier. And depending on the state of the blood-brain barrier, may ultimately lead to neuroinflammation uh, that leads to neuronal dysfunction, neuronal death. And then as you, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, potentially delirium, postoperative cognitive dysfunction, and potentially even dementia. So in terms of current and future directions, uh, because we saw that 33% that incidence in our urogynecologic patient population, uh, we've expanded upon this quite a bit. And so we are continuing to recruit patients who are 70 years and older and undergoing major prolapse surgery, but now we are following them prospectively um, out to two years. So we're doing baseline testing, but then testing again at two weeks, three months, one year, and then two years. In addition, we're examining uh, neuroinflammation, peripheral inflammation, and uh, of course, we're assessing for APOE4 status as well uh, to get a sense of any of these potential biologic mechanisms and how they may influence perioperative neurocognitive disorders. I bring this up here because during the time that I started with that initial study, uh, the I START perioperative cognition and delirium working group had come uh, together and put out these nom nomenclature recommendations, which is excellent. So now this puts us all who are doing research in this space on the same page in terms of what we should expect to use as diagnostic criteria. And they've changed some of the, the terms that we're using. So you can see in this table here, two weeks is really not a point where they would call it postoperative cognitive dysfunction anymore, but really it's delayed neurocognitive recovery. And then the time points there on the left of the screen, beyond 12 months is when you start to get concerned, is there something else going on? And I just specify that there, that post-operative specifier is no longer attached if you go beyond 12 months. So you see the figure just on top of that, uh, I just added in the delayed neurocognitive recovery is really what we're looking for at two weeks. Again, it's a clinically relevant time point. Uh, so we do think that that's an important time to assess patients and make sure uh, that they're not at a state where they can uh, potentially cause an issue to, for themselves, like taking the wrong medication or having an issue with driving. And then at the three months and one year points, this is really what we would call major or mild neurocognitive disorder as per the criteria in the DSM-5, which again, just gets us all on the same page. These are just acknowledgments, uh, acknowledgments for collaborators and mentors that I've been working with, and of course, my support. And then I welcome any questions or comments that you may have for me. Thank you. Okay, sure, sure. Um, I may have missed this, but the pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, so you don't have data on that. So the question was, do I have data on pro-inflammatory cytokines? I'm collecting that actively right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you're basically looking for, um, I'll just say the word like cytokine storm, like after somebody has some kind of traumatic event, there's big 
change in cytokines and that's the kind of thing that you're looking for? Yeah, we're looking to see if, you know, not only just not only the fluctuations in the cytokine levels, but also, you know, some patients come to the table with chronic inflammation. And so at baseline too, maybe they're already predisposed. And perhaps those are the patients that are more at risk of developing perioperative neurocognitive disorders. So I'd say, you know, baseline status, as well as fluctuating changes in what's going on at the time that they're getting their repeat neurocognitive testing. Nice, right. So, um, so I was curious because a lot of those cytokines are considered sleep regulating cytokines. I'm a sleep person. So. Um, <laughs> um, so I am curious um, if those are expected to change, you know, fluctuate in a major way. Are those things associated with sleep, and would that have anything to do with any of the neurocognitive changes that you're? Uh, the question that was asked is uh, because of the potential for the inflammatory mediators to be related to sleep, um, do, do I expect there to be, you know, do I expect there to be sleep changes or am I thinking about that essentially is what was being asked. And that's a really great point. Uh, absolutely, sleep regulation can be altered in the post-operative setting. We are not capturing that right now, but it is a good point because the inflammatory markers can be, you know, moving in different directions for various things that we're not capturing. We're trying to get as much as we can. I mean, we're collecting data on nutrition. We're collecting data on anxiety, pain, uh, subjective cognitive functioning. I mean, we have a lot of different factors, but one that we don't is sleep. We do generally ask them when we do their delirium assessments and when they come in, like, how are you sleeping? But I think a subjective report is very different than actual, you know, actual objective data in terms of how they're sleeping. Thanks. Seems so exciting. Thank you. Oh, here is idea. Yeah, a basic question. One excellent talk. Um, so I know a lot of uh, anesthetic agents impact cardiovascular tone as well as like human impact factors. Did you guys see a breakdown for who is at risk for PFCD depending on the anesthesia protocol that they received during the surgical procedure? So with that cohort of seventy-two, we didn't we didn't see anything. We did look at specific. We looked at them grouped as like, okay, those who got inhalational agents, did we see anything? Those who got regional anesthesia versus general, did we see anything? And we we didn't see any significance. In fact, there were no intraoperative factors that were predictive or associated with POCD, but I really do think that the sample was just too small. I also think that we didn't have enough of a difference. So like we had a few patients that had regional, but when I say a few, I'd say like a handful um, because we did start an enhanced recovery after surgery protocol during the time of this study. And at that hospital, it's largely general anesthesia. They very very in, infrequently will use regional anesthesia, at least for these surgeries. Um, so because of that, I don't think there's enough of a, a distribution to really be able to assess that appropriately from a statistical standpoint. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, do you do any CSF sampling? Um, do you happen to be um, during a surgical procedure um, getting CSF? Uh, that, and I forgot to repeat your question. The next question is, do I obtain any CSF uh, during the procedures? Uh, so no, we generally don't. And I think that's largely because many of the patients uh, in our clinical practice, not just the study, but in our clinical practice undergo general anesthesia because of the enhanced recovery after surgery protocol. Uh, and so because we are not already there and obtaining it, uh, we have found uh, based off of just chatting with patient, patients and interviewing them um, that uh, consenting for a CSF sample may be a little bit more challenging. Um, but absolutely being able to obtain uh, a sample like that would be very helpful. So that way we could potentially do uh, CSF biomarkers too. Uh, but we do hope to be able to do plasma biomarkers in the future. Um, and then looking forward to that as a future direction for our work. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, okay. you so much. Thank you.